to Diego for the invitation. Thanks a lot to Robert for suggesting my name. It's, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you um, online on Zoom to, to discuss you know, some aspect of my, my recent uh, research. Indeed, as Diego just uh, mentioned, I published a few years ago a book which I entitled International Migration Narratives. And that's basically what I want to talk about, updating it with some recent uh, developments. Uh, and I will try as much as I can to sort of develop a kind of anthropological perspective on those international migration narratives, or IMN as I call them. So I'm going to share the screen uh, because I have a little PowerPoint, a uh, few slides, mostly with quote, quotes, just to, to give some, 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 some illustrations of what I mentioned. Um, so let me just quickly move. There we go. I uh, hope you can all uh, properly uh, see um, see the screen. Uh, let me. Uh, there we go. Uh, so, anthropological perspective, international migration narratives, and uh, yes, um, basically, what do I call IMN uh, international migration narratives? Um, it's the outcome of a fairly recent process at the international level uh, or intergovernmental level, especially uh, UN uh, level, uh, which has seen the issue of migration discussed at, you know, quite intensively uh, in, this, at this, in these institutions. Um, so I, I'm not going to give a kind of history of the topic or the way the topic was addressed at the UN level, but it's a fairly new process, even though the topic has been around for quite a while, uh, but it's a fairly new process that really started in the late 90s when migration became a big issue, uh, sensitive issue uh, at the UN level and states started discussing it uh, at the UN level or within other uh, international fora or international uh, organizations. And so my hypothesis here is that this new institutional context, the fact that states start discussing migration not only inside their own territory or with you know, comparable you know, other states like inside the EU, for example, but really start to discuss it at the international level, that is to say with, for example, you know, uh, sending states talking to receiving states uh, and rich states talking to poor states uh, and so on, this has produced a new doxa, so to say, or a new narrative about international migration and what it's all about. So IMN is the outcome of this. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, 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 it's a tricky issue, uh, tricky thing to, to, to define because it's the outcome of uh, a process of discussion, but it's also the condition for the discussion to take place as I try um, to explain. And basically, to put it very simply, uh, that's perhaps the, the, the first title I wanted to give to the book, uh, but then the editor told me it was too long. Uh, it was what migration is and what it should be, because that's exactly what IMN are all about. They actually tell the reader or what you know, the key issues, um, migration related issues are all about. And they also outline the, an horizon uh, a policy direction, policy recommendations pertaining to how you know, immigration policy should address this topic uh, in order to improve the governance of uh, migration. And to put it very simply, that's a highly political issue because without going into a sort of deep political economy of migration, but it's very easy to understand that migration is a highly divisive and politicized issue. States do not at all share the same interests. Uh, to put it very simply, you have a big divide between obviously sending and receiving states. Uh, and you also have a divide inside states, uh, for example, inside European states, between political parties, between NGOs, the private sector, the government, uh, and so on. So you have no real consensus uh, on this topic, on what a good immigration policy should look like. And it's a big challenge to actually produce a narrative that is acceptable to all the stakeholders in this uh, debate at the international level, which include not only uh, very different states from the poorest possible states uh, to the most developed countries, but also uh, non-state actors like uh, big NGOs, for example, but also representatives of the private sector, for example. So you have all those actors in the room and the issue is how do you produce a narrative that is acceptable to all about a topic that is highly uh, divisive and really is highly politicized. So you have to produce a depoliticized consensus, uh, hence the title of the book, you know, Depoliticizing uh, Migration. And as I said, um, this narrative is the outcome of the discussion, 
but you also need this narrative to actually set up uh, the agenda. Uh, it's very difficult to organize a meeting if you don't, at the beginning of the meeting, uh, don't, if you don't have at the beginning of the meeting, a kind of you know, cons um, starting consensus to, to, to construct a discussion uh, upon. Um, so it's a condition for the debate to take place and it's also the outcome of the, uh, of the debate. So this is basically what I call international migration narratives. And uh, perhaps very quickly, uh, well, here are a few key steps uh, in terms of the short history of those debates. Uh, you may have heard about the Cairo Conference on Population Development some 25 years ago, uh, which was one of the first occurrences in which, you know, uh, event at which migration became discussed at a big UN international conference. And then you have a big list of different events. It's not that important. Perhaps some of you have heard about the 2018 Global Compact on Migration, sometimes called the Marrakesh uh, Compact and Marrakesh Agreement, because it was adopted in Marrakesh in December 2018. And it became a big politicized issue, uh, because if some of you have followed the news, the Trump administration uh, withdrew from the process, and many other European states also withdrew. And all of a sudden, this was a fairly sort of standard, you know, depoliticized uh, bureaucratic routine. It became a big political issue with key uh, global leaders, you know, taking a stance on this, uh, on this, um, on this global compact. But the global compact, importantly enough, is is the outcome of well, at least two decades of discussion during which you can actually produce this consensus, produce those international migration uh, narratives. Uh, so just to tell you, you know, give some example, uh, many, many meetings, uh, lots of people going from one meeting to the other, taking the floor at all those meetings and producing reports, background documents, um, all kinds of documents uh, that come along with this, 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 this highly you know, sort of intensive discursive activity at the UN and at other intergovernmental um, fora. So perhaps just before I start you know, analyzing you know, international migration narrative and how anthropology perhaps can help us understand what they're all about, uh, I just give a brief indication of why I got interested in that. It turned out that for almost a decade, uh, I was not in academia, but I was working at UNESCO here in Paris uh, at the migration unit at UNESCO. And here I have a little quote uh, from Richard Hoggart, you know, the well-known British sociologist, who actually also worked at UNESCO for a few years in the 70s, if I'm correct. It's a quote from his autobiography it's called Imagine Life, published at OUP. And he has this nice uh, quote about what happens when you actually work in such a big organization. Uh, you can simply read the quote, but basically uh, the problem is that as a bureaucrat, you actually move from one topic to the other. So when you start you actually recruited to work on a specific topic, as I was, because I was recruited to work on migration specifically. But if I had stayed at UNESCO, I probably would have needed to you know, move to other units and work on other topics. And then the risk is that, you no, know, as Hoggett describes, you get increasingly out of touch and you no longer know what you're talking about. Uh, you still work on all kinds of programs, uh, but without knowing anything about uh, what you are addressing, at least, you know, not knowing in, in the topic in, in, in a detailed uh, manner. Uh, so that's basically a kind of, you know, you know lay, from sociology of labor perspective on uh, this topic. You have people, uh, lots of people working in different UN organizations that at some point in the late 90s, early 2000, precisely because of all those uh, events I just mentioned on this, this in the previous screen, because of all those events, those people had to basically start working on uh, migration. But the fact is they didn't know anything about the topic simply because they were not trained in this field and they were working on other issues and simply the normal you know, bureaucratic administrative way of doing things that you move people from one unit uh, to the other and you ask people to adapt to a new position if there's a new topic that emerges. So basically that's what happens. Migration become, became a key issue and you know, most UN organizations did not have any migration specialist. Some of them recruited some uh, migration specialist. That's why I was actually recruited at UNESCO in the first place. But many of them simply had to ask their staff to adapt, which implies a kind of knowledge. Um, of course, you have to get to, you get to know the job, how to get things done, but also you need to know the topic if you want to be able to take the floor, write background documents, commission studies, uh, talk to other experts, specialists, uh, other um, international civil servants. You need the basic knowledge of the topic, otherwise you simply cannot do uh, the job. So that's the kind of background in which I found myself. 
uh, working, uh, I had a PhD in migration studies, uh, and I found myself working with lots of people who didn't know much, and I first wondered, you know, how do they, you know, how do they manage to work on migration without the prior knowledge, and it turned out that international migration narratives played a key role there. Basically, uh, they served as a kind of blueprint. Uh, blueprint, you know, what the blueprint is, it's, it's a very sort of standardized description of the topic, very basic, uh, very simple. It tells you the most basic things you really need to know, and it describes the topic. So if you read a report, a UN report uh, on migration, you have a blueprint of the topic. It's not very detailed, it's not very programmatized, it's not very interesting, it's a bit blah blah, it's a bit superficial, but it gives lots of people the basic knowledge they need to start addressing a topic in their you know, professional uh, environment. But all less, more, moreover, sorry, uh, migration is widely understood uh, when, I was, when I arrived at UNESCO as you know, a kind of frightening issue. Uh, people know it's a politically highly sensitive issue, and they're very much afraid of hurting states' interest or of saying things that would be understood as you know, contrary to, to, to states' priority. So they are extremely prudent. They, you know, they, they venture you know, with caution on this very you know, touchy, sensitive uh, issue. And they need, therefore, a kind of not only a blueprint to understand the topic, but to understand what they can say and what they should avoid saying. So basically, these international migration narratives, they give you uh, ready-made, uh, easy to use, uh, knowledge about migration, and moreover, they tell you what you can say and what you cannot say in political terms, because there are always topics that are too sensitive to be addressed at the intergovernmental level. States will not accept to discuss certain issues. Uh, for example, the human rights of irregular migrants, it's typically a very sensitive issue, and many Western governments will resist organizing a, a topic, uh, organizing a session on this topic, because they don't want to be accused of you know disrespecting the human rights of undocumented migrants. So you have to know this. And typically IMN international migration narratives tell you what you can say, what you cannot say. So I felt, you know, just to give a little traditional uh, insight from uh, from anthropology, uh, I felt a bit like you know uh, this reading over the shoulders, the very famous metaphor used by Clifford Gears in his paper on the Malinese cockfight. You know, I had the impression that those people, my 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 former colleagues at the UN, they were actually reading migration. They're reading texts, those international migration narratives, and through this text, they were actually reading the social topic they had to uh, work on. Uh, they were sort of reading migration, and I was a kind of, you know, I was felt like I was stepping behind the shoulder and was actually watching them uh, reading uh, migration. So, you know, I often had this image, just a standard, you know, well-known anthropological metaphor in mind when working on this IMN, uh, understanding how those colleagues were actually understanding migration, kind of meta-understanding of, of migration. And IMN are exactly about this, you know, they, they provide the basic knowledge about the topic, and I thought I should actually understand not only migration per se, but I should understand the way migration is represented and uh, perceived by the people in the UN who have to work on this. Uh, bearing in mind that it's not only a UN issue, bearing in mind that uh, to a large extent, these are influential views, um, I'll come back to this later, but for example, um, it's, it's some, if some of you may know that, for example, a key topic today in migration studies is the so-called migration development nexus, for example, uh, because it's a big issue for IMN. So basically, the UN, they, they approach migration largely for the developmental, developmental sorry, approach, and uh, therefore, you have a lot of research on this topic. So to some extent, this UN way of looking at things is influential well beyond the UN. It shapes a lot of studies. It you know, orientates some of the research perspectives. It provides funding, obviously. It defines what is, inter what is interesting, what is uninteresting, what is relevant, what is irrelevant, well beyond uh, the UN sphere. So there's a nice quote uh, I like from a guy called Raymond Aptop, working on development narratives. And he says that basically they are carried to be captured, otherwise it would capture you. So basically, either you actually you know, understand um, or you, you establish a critical distance towards this body of research and knowledge on migration, or you actually get trapped inside it and you start repeating it in your own, uh, in your own research. So it's really an issue for the autonomy of social sciences with respect to policy narratives, especially because that's another big issue. Uh, lots of migration scholars today, uh, understandably enough, 
tend to be dissatisfied with the, the own government's approach to migration. Uh, they criticize you know, heavily um, key trends in immigration policy. And very often they see the UN as a more open venue for their research. Uh, if you work on you know, human rights development um, or non-security issues pertaining to migration, you will not be very welcome if you work with your own government, who is mostly obsessed with security issues, at least if you come from the global north. But it might well be that you will be more welcome uh, if you reach out to the UN because you know, they have a broader perspective on a topic. And lots of key researchers today, influential researchers also, uh, do work a lot with uh, different uh, international organizations like the UN, like the International Organization for Migration and other uh, similar organizations. And this actually makes for a kind of you know, mixed milieu in which you have both UN civil servants and researchers and experts and NGOs. And many of those people actually share this vocabulary, which is in, uh, inside, which you can find inside international migration narratives. So a few you know, background uh, elements about why I got interested in this, largely because there was this idea, you know, I had to understand not migration per se, but how migration was perceived by those people. And because I thought that there was an issue about how to think you know, outside the box, quote unquote, uh, in the sense uh, that lots of research that is commissioned on migration is actually a bit boring and repetitive, precisely because it is actually, it fits inside uh, within the paradigm established by international migration narratives and not outside. Uh, so these were the, the key points uh, I had uh, in mind. And I'm not going, going to go inside the details of the, the key arguments put forward by those, by those IMN because that would really be a kind of migration seminar and that's not my purpose here. Uh, but I'm still gonna give a few basic a uh, little idea about what, what they have to say about migration, because some people may wonder, you know, what, what is the content of those, of those narratives? So four key arguments, just to outline them um, before going further. Uh, the first is this idea, uh, is this challenge to sovereignty, um, not a direct challenge to sovereignty, but nevertheless, the idea that migration cannot be governed by states alone by sovereign states acting alone um, on, based on their own and interest, uh, because that's, it's a global issue and global issue requires global governance, as it's often called. And therefore there's a call for cooperation between states over migration uh, issues, which is in itself a pretty big challenge. Uh, lots of states uh, tend to think that you know, they are happy to cooperate over development or human rights with other states, but not over uh, migration. So there's this call for cooperation, call for a kind of multilateral approach to the topic, which is very strong inside IMN. Obviously, it's a pro domo argument because you know, if states want to have a multilateral approach to migration, then they have to resort probably to UN agencies. So it's a kind of pro domo um, argument, but nevertheless, it's, it's a key point. Uh, they have a fairly optimistic uh, uh, appreciation of migration, contrary to widespread you know, pessimism or negative views uh, inside um, societies, especially in the global north about migrants, migration as being a problem. They see this as a normal and beneficial process. They call this the triple win. That's one of those simple slogans that you find all over the place in these international migration narratives. A triple win because migration should benefit sending and receiving countries both of them and also migrants themselves. So triple, uh, triple beneficial uh, process. Mm -hmm. And they connect migration to other topics. As I said a few minutes ago, um, the main connection today tends to be the sort of migration security nexus. They open up the box and they try to connect migration to development, uh, to human rights, to climate change, to other big topics for the international community. So sort of putting you know, migration as one of those big global issues that has to be addressed globally by the international, the so-called international community. Um, and last, uh, universal principles, uh, human rights and also free market, they have a fairly sort of you know, liberal approach to migration understood as you know, a necessary uh, process of labor mobility in a globalizing uh, economy. Uh, so conciliating uh, in a kind of post-Washington uh, consensus, uh, a kind of you know, um, pro-globalization stance with uh, the protection of fundamental human rights for, 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 for all uh, migrants. So this, of course, I could develop a lot more the content of, of, of these uh, IMN is just to give you a little idea 
about what they say, what they recommend, and how they they break away from some of the standard arguments you will hear in the mouth of, of national governments, especially in the global north, uh, that tend to view migration mostly as a threat, as a security issue that needs to be uh, repressed or controlled, and that does not bring any good uh, to the uh, country, with some exceptions, of course, you know, with skilled migration or you know, high skilled um, high skilled migration. Right. Okay. So these are the key arguments, and so. Uh, what follows, I'm trying to, to, to understand, you know, how can we understand those texts? That's a question I often ask myself. When you read a report by the UN, what are you actually reading? Um, and what's the nature of, of this text, uh, of this discourse? Uh, and I'm just going to give a few, uh, you know, few different few ways that, you know, pro, um, different ways of uh, addressing or conceptualizing uh, IMN. And so the first one, there's a quote here from a well-known paper by two international relations scholars uh, working in international organizations. Uh, they have very constructivist, constructivist sorry, perspective, and they argue that you may well you know, conceive uh, IOs as weak organizations, um, lacking material resources, as they call it, but nevertheless, they construct the social world. So that's an obvious and very accurate uh, statement. Um, you can see IMN as shaping worldviews, shaping a cognitive, so to say, uh, framework through which you apprehend uh, the world. Uh, IMN again tell you what is important, what is not, and they actually map the social world, construct it in the words of Barnett and Finnemore, uh, and they provide this cognitive framework, and the assumption is that somehow this cognitive framework, either explicitly or implicitly, will shape the way people, societies, policymakers, civil society uh, perceive so-called problems, and therefore also the way they uh, elaborate possible uh, solutions to these uh, problems. So that's a very you know, standard constructivist argument. IMN would be about building worldviews, building a paradigm through which the world is apprehended, and therefore a, a paradigm that will shape uh, policy and policy responses to, 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 to migration related challenges. This usually you can connect this, I'm not going to do this in depth here today, but you can connect this to the role of data. It's obviously a very big issue. Uh, IMN stressed that they are so called evidence based and therefore they keep providing data. And you have indeed uh, lots of IOs like the World Bank that have become key data producers on migration. For example, you know, you may know that lots of migrants send a lot of money back home to their home country, so-called remittances, and all the data we, know, we have about remittances all come from the World Bank, and therefore the World Bank, even without saying anything, uh, only through producing numbers, so to say, producing data, producing figures, they already shape uh, the debate, because basically all the people who work on remittances at some point will quote World Bank data or will rely on World Bank uh, data. Uh, so obviously, uh, evidence-based cognitive frameworks rely a lot on uh, data. So that's one possible you know, conceptualization of IMN. Uh, the second one is a more like an epistemic community approach, this concept by Peter Haas, epistemic communities. There's a quote by Millen Rose, um, which I think is quite telling, um, and that's quite relevant to IMN. It's basically the idea that if you want to have a political coalition, if you want to join forces with other people far away from where you are, you need a shared vocabulary, as they call it. Uh, so basically, that's quite relevant because migration is a very diverse issue. I mean, itself, talking about migration is problematic because you can easily agree, uh, uh, you can easily argue, for example, that if you look at people's mobility in Africa, uh, for, to put it very simply, it would be mostly about forced migration, refugee, and this type of uh, process. Whereas if you look at uh, migration in, say, India, it's much more about economic migration, labor, uh, and so on. Um, so, you know, you have very different manifestations of the migration process throughout the world. And if you want to act at the global level, you need to join forces. Uh, you need to establish joint worldviews with people, you know, you have um, Asian NGOs that are going to have to discuss and build a common uh, statement or common program with, you know, civil society coming from, say, Brazil, for example. They come from completely different countries, completely different political traditions, completely different history, especially migration history, but somehow 
uh, they have to uh, build up a, a joint position because at the UN level, that's how it goes. You have civil society that will come and civil society has to produce a kind of joint statement um, which requires the elaboration of a shared vocabulary, shared theories, shared worldviews or explanations. And basically, IMN here would actually support those epistemic communities, the, the, the communities of people who share basically the same episteme or the same way of looking at things. And then you would have different sub communities, so to say, uh, when you go to those big meetings organized by UN, by the UN, you have a group of you know, rich developed states that have their, their narrative. You have poor states from the global south that have their own narratives. You have private sector, CSO, different groups. They all come up with the sub narrative, so to say. And out of that, you've got a big lengthy negotiation and there's a kind of international migration narrative that emerges out of those different uh, sub narratives, so to say. So the narrative is not really here to, to tell us you know, in this view, the point is not to understand migration, it's rather to build um, partnerships, to build connection uh, across the world, across actors, across very different uh, positions. And at the end of the day, you have a narrative that is global in the sense that you could apply it, theoretically speaking, to migration in and out of, say, Ethiopia or Bangladesh or Paraguay. You now, it should apply everywhere, which is a big challenge because you know, reality is very different all, all across these different places. But uh, somehow, the aspiration of IMN and the actors behind IMN is precisely to have a shared vocabulary that would apply everywhere. So here, narratives are mostly about constructing a global reality that enables actors to act globally. Uh, if you stick to a too detailed or down to earth description of migration, then you cannot sort of move up uh, and then you cannot uh, adopt uh, sort of global connections uh, between actors, between states or NGOs, for example, across the world. That's the second uh, conceptualization of IMN as a kind of, you know, of, of narrative that supports cooperation. Um, the third one, uh, very influential work, very interesting work by Cornwall and Brock on, on development uh, narratives. I borrowed a lot uh, from their work and from more general anthropology of development uh, literature uh, to analyze you know, international migration narratives. Uh, basically, um, their quote is about um, a kind, uh, it moved, we're getting closer to kind of anthropological take on the topic. Uh, it creates a feeling of togetherness, as they call it. Uh, the idea here is that through uh, international migration nar narratives, as I said already before, um, you actually construct a shared ground, a common ground for the discussion, and you can actually have states uh, come together and meet at a meeting. Uh, this is not possible if you do not have a kind of consensual agenda to support the organization of the meeting. So I am in here a kind of nice story everybody can agree with, and it brings people together, this feeling of togetherness, it brings states together, it invites them to agree on certain aspects of the topic, and therefore it actually supports the very organization of a meeting, which would be impossible if you didn't have this kind of you know, nice, attractive story about what migration is uh, and what it should be, in a way of attracting um, states and other stakeholders uh, to your meeting and to uh, kind of UN way of doing things. So uh, this is about really uh, creating togetherness, creating consensus, creating a narrative that is shareable enough for all states to, 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 to agree with it and to agree to attend uh, the meeting. The first, uh, third conceptualization. And the last one he uh, here is a quote I like from someone who works in the field of water management and water development projects, who talks about so-called, what he calls Nirvana concepts. Uh, nirvana concept, the way he describes it, is an ideal uh, world, what you could call an ideal migration world, uh, what the world should look like. It displays, no, it describes a horizon, a uh, very you know, long-term horizon, and people kind of know that we'll never reach this horizon. It, uh, IMN describe an ideal world that will never materialize, but nevertheless, it's a good thing to have this origin. It, again, it brings people uh, together, 
And it's a kind of, no, you're actually getting closer to anthropology of religion and mythology here. Uh, and also what's, what I like here is this idea that a nirvana is a photo negative of the real world. So basically you take the world as it is now, you're unhappy with the world as it is now, and the IMN uh, as a nirvana concept would actually uh, turn the way, turn the picture the other way around and provide a kind of ideal description of what the world would look like. That is in many respects exactly the opposite of what the world is now, right now. Uh, so it's taking the world, uh, sort of looking behind it or in inversing it and describing an ideal uh, migration world, um, knowing somehow that this is never going to happen, but still it's a good thing somehow uh, to have this, this Nirvana uh, idea, this Nirvana narrative uh, in, on the back of your mind actually helps you uh, cope with uh, the challenges that exist in the real world. Um, so perhaps here we, we're getting closer to what could be an anthropological take on those IMN, uh, which is a kind of you no know, myth inspired uh, perception of IMN. Um, for example, very simply, if you attend those meetings, uh, if you go to a UN meeting on migration, there's a big room. There are lots of people in the room coming from all possible states uh, throughout the world, lots of NGO people, uh, all kinds of observers. And you have lots of people who, one after the other, they take the floor and they start talking about what should be done in terms of migration policy at the global level. And it's always the same thing. They keep repeating the same message all the time. Basically, they keep repeating those IMN all the time. So there's absolutely no surprise as to what people are going to say. You actually know before they start you know, talking uh, that basically, you know, they're going to develop the same points that all the other people in, in the room. So it's a kind of a ritual. And there's this nice paper by Moise Bloch, well known in political anthropology, uh, arguing that basically political language is a ritual language. There's no, there's no, there's no, nothing interesting about the content of political language. What matters is oratory. That is to say the fact that you are in a position uh, to speak and to, to, to enact this political language. So basically the, the point here is that IMN are not, I mean, the content of IMN is completely irrelevant. No one cares about the content of IMN. The key point is that you agree to be in the room and that you agree to take the floor and you agree to listen to each other. Uh, so that's really a kind of ritual, political ritual uh, that IMN supports. And very practically, you know, if you're in this meeting, you can enter the room and if you get bored, you can leave the room, you can come back half an hour later and you're not at all lost, you're not at all disoriented because it's always the same uh, blah, blah going on. Uh, so you never really uh, actually, you know, you never feel that you have to follow the argument. You know the argument well before it's developed. And even though you, you miss the, 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 the speech of a government representative, you can easily guess uh, what was said. I mean, there's no, there's no need for you to, 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 to catch up. It's, it's actually, you know, very, it's, it's so, so expectable that there's no, absolutely no surprise. So the key thing is that the person was there and spoke uh, and was listened to by his fellow uh, government officials. And this is already enough to make for a big political event. So political language here is, is not, I mean, the content of political language does not matter. What matters is that the ritual takes place and the ritual requires this political language, this standardized, um, not new uh, political language in order for, to, to take place. So here you have, you know, it raises a lot of questions. Um, perhaps a key point also, very simple point, but when you, uh, when you read those reports, uh, UN reports, IOM reports on migration, you always wonder who's talking, you know, uh, there's no author. Um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, there are a few people mentioned at the beginning, you know, in the, in the acknowledgements that, you know, contributed to the draft. Usually these are, you know, young people, interns um, working on, on, on the draft, uh, but they're not properly speaking the author of the, of the, of the, of the document. Uh, it's not an institutional author either, because the UN always say that, no, they publish the report, but they take no responsibility for the content. It's only a contribution to the debate. There's always a little disclaimer somewhere arguing that, you know, uh, stating that the UN is not responsible for the content of the report. So you always wonder, you know, who actually is speaking? And actually it's no one. Uh, it's a kind of, you know, um, collective uh, narrative, quite close to mythology. You know, you don't actually know who uh, created, who wrote it down for the first time, 
it's just here. And then the next report will actually build upon the last one and will be slightly different, but almost the same, uh, and so on and so on. So a kind of oral tradition, oral a reiteration of mythology, you know, from one meeting to the other, all the different meetings I showed you on the slide at the, at the beginning. Uh, so what's interesting here, you know, this this nice book, Anthropology of Policy by Chris Shaw and Susan Wright, um, they write that, uh, I forgot to put the, 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 the reference, I'm sorry about that, but it's Chris Shaw and Susan Wright, it's called Anthropology of Policy, it was published in the 90s, if I'm correct, at, with Routledge, uh, and they say that policy is a cultural text, but still grounded in legal rational knowledge. So it makes for interesting tension here, because on the one hand, if you really take Iron Man as the myth, there's no reason that the myth should connect to reality. There's no reason the myth should be evidence-based, obviously not. The myth, on the contrary, can become completely disconnected from reality. You know, animals can talk, and they can be half animal, half human beings. You no, know, it can be completely imaginary. On the other hand, Iron Man are not this type of myth. They want to connect to reality. They are full of data. They want to be evidence-based. Uh, and you have you want to be internally coherent. Uh, so there's this tension you know, between a kind of mythological text on the one hand and the aspiration to stick to reality uh, on the other, uh, the, what, what Shaw and Wright call the legal rational uh, approach inside those policy or those cultural texts. And perhaps you know, the last way you can conceptualize I am and his myth is this traditional idea that basically myth provides an answer to questions for which there's no answer. Uh, so to put it simply, there are lots of dilemma in the real world um, that uh, you, 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 you don't know how to solve. And if you want to solve them, you cannot solve them in the real world, but you can solve them at the level of discourses or narratives or at the level of the mythical, imaginary level or mythical level, so to say. So here I have a very concre concrete quote. It comes, it's a quote from the Global Commission on International Migration, it was an inferential commission, one of those global commission that you know, sort of provide an overview of the topic, worked in the early 2000s. And I took this quote because I think it's a very interesting one in terms of you know, this, this mythological way of thinking. It's about brain drain, you know what brain drain is all about. It's the fact that lots of, of, of skilled migrants leave their country, they leave poor countries with you know, their doctors or engineers, and they leave the country, and that's usually understood as a big problem, because obviously the home country, their poor home country, would need doctors, they would need nurses, they would need engineers, but somehow those people prefer going abroad, and they are recruited to work abroad in the global north, and that's you know a kind of very unfair process because global north has already plenty of resources uh, of skilled people, and always and, and even further it takes the people, the skilled people from poor, poor countries. Hence the concept of brain drain, this huge literature on brain drain. And obviously the, the GCIM, this global commission, is very unhappy about this you know, idea of brain drain because it, it's very political. It, it really it, it makes for a very political economy issue in which there are very strongly diverging interests between sending and receiving country. You know, when a doctor leaves a country to work in another country, it's a loss for a country and it's a win for another country. And it's very difficult to provide a shared narrative about this uh, and to argue for the so-called triple win uh, approach I mentioned before. So brain drain is a not, not an uneasy issue for, for, for international migration narratives. And uh, this quote is very interesting because it says, well, you know, brain drain exists, but somehow it's outdated. Uh, now we need to have brain circulation. So that's the typical answer of IMN to brain drain. It says, well, brain drain is no problem because at some point skilled people will come back to the country with more skills or they will somehow contribute through, through distance, what they call knowledge diaspora. Um, diaspora would contribute to the development of the home country. Uh, but that's you know, what could really, what could be called wishful thinking because you have a real world problem uh, and you have a nirvana answer, so to say. So the real world problem is the brain drain. The fact that poor countries you know, lose skilled professionals in fields that can be very crucial, like education or health or whatever. Uh, so that's a real world problem, real political economy problem. And the answer is not a kind of, it's not a policy solution. It's actually, you know, a kind of imaginary uh, magic transformation in the world in which all of a sudden the problem would disappear. It would be replaced by brain circulation that would be in the interest of everybody. So just a very, you know, five lines quotes here, two sentences, but which illustrate what, what you know, a kind of, this kind of mythical approach. You have a real world problem and 
that's that you, you can actually you know, apprehend this for a kind of you know, traditional uh, uh, a la Levi Strauss approach to mythology. You know, the myth sort of resolving a structural contradiction and transcending this structural contradiction through you know, uh, uh, the elaboration of a mythical uh, language. So this is here you know, quite, quite evident as far as I can see it. Um, you have a real world problem and you don't solve the problem. You simply uh, establish a nirvana as the, the former quote I just showed would say. Uh, you say, well, this is what we should head to. And somehow you will never reach this brain circulation that is in the interest of all. This will never happen. But somehow it's good to think that the real world problem could at some level be eradicated and that a kind of new you know, mythical horizon can, can emerge in which this problem would simply vanish, would disappear. So, you know, it's, it's a nice mixture of acknowledging a problem on the one hand, a real world problem, and providing a mythical solution uh, on the other hand. A uh, confusing mixture, but I guess typical of mythical language in which you, you know, you, you, you come from, you, know, you, you, you start from the ground and you sort of climb up at another level in which reality becomes completely changed, completely transformed by, by the mythical language. Um, so those myths may have different functions here. Uh, have uh, outline how how much time do I still have? Uh, let me just check. Uh, what time is it? Yes. Uh, so I just have a few, perhaps a few, you know, five or ten minutes, if if that's possible. Is that okay? I'm respecting the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, let's let's assume uh, I'm I'm on time. Um, so. Uh, myth have this federation fun function, uh, bringing together diverging views. And here there's another quote, again from the same Cornwall, Andrea Cornwall, very interesting work uh, on what she calls buzzwords. And here the, the, the most simple example is the example I already, give, already gave of migration development, the so-called migration development nexus. If you look carefully at how, you know, at how this plays out, this migration development nexus, you realize that, to put it very simply, for receiving states, uh, they want development so that they have less migration. Basically, Europe states, European states, they want development in Africa, for example, in order to reduce the migration pressure, pressure and to have less migrants coming from Africa. Basically, that's that's their take on migration development. And if you take African countries, to put it very simply again, of course, in practice, it's more complex, more complicated, there are more nuances. But in, to put it very simply, African countries, they want more migration because they believe that in the interest of their development. Because if they have more out migration, they will have more remittances and they will actually alleviate the pressure on the labor market. So they agree to discuss migration development. But if you look carefully, what they have in mind is completely different. And that's exactly what you know Cornwall call a buzzword. A buzzword is something that superficially we all agree upon. There's a connection between migration and development, and we should establish a policy connection between the two fields. But uh, in practice, the way we define this nexus and the type of policy we would have to implement are completely different. Uh, they have nothing uh, to say with each other. And therefore, uh, we actually have a federating function. You provide a language that is vague enough, or open enough, or ambivalent enough to host different interpretations. So there's never one single meaning uh, with IMN, just like with myth, myth, myth or mythologists. I mean, there's, there's no one single meaning. There are always interpretations and everybody can find his or her way uh, uh, of interpreting uh, the, the story and can find justification for his or her behavior. So all states can read IMN and we all agree because they have what, they, what they're looking for in the text and they can ignore other aspects of the text. Uh, so the text is actually you know, constructing consensus that does not exist in the real world on the ground, but the consensus can exist on paper, so to say, in the text, um, in the narrative. So narratives actually create a consensus uh, that does not exist, exist on the ground. And somehow that's the power of language. Uh, the consensus on paper is strong enough for the meeting to take place and for governments to, to keep discussing the issue for the last you know, 20 years. So the narrative is strong enough to uh, bring the actors together, even though, uh, of course, if you go into the details, uh, there's no consensus at all. Um, but, but the text 
does as if there was a consensus precisely for the use of buzzwords like so-called migration and development uh, nexus. Uh, an ordering function, um, that's another typical function of political languages, actually describing the world and ordering the world. Um, typically, for example, um, IMN will identify different patterns of migration, different types of people, migrants versus refugees, that's a standard divide by there are many more. They will identify skilled migrants, student migrants, uh, forced migrants, refugee, economic migrants, um, uh, family reunification migrants, climate change migrants, whatever. And they will sort of divide the world into what Sigmund Bauman called solvable little problems. Uh, I like this quote, uh, in which basically, you know, uh, you manage the world by dividing it into plethora of solvable little problem. As he puts it, uh, the world becomes manageable uh, because somehow you have distinguished uh, different problems. And for each problem, you provide a kind of you know, manager or management solution uh, to this uh, problem. So actually, you know, when you have a big, complex, threatening reality in front of you, what the language does, what the political language does, says, well, look, don't panic. Uh, this is what's going on. You have different problems and you have to go step by step and you will solve the different problems one after the other. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, if you take the migrant refugee divide, uh, it's quite clear that according to international organizations, we should adopt different policy depending upon whether we have a migrant or refugee in front of us. In practice, we all know that the distinction is hardly possible to establish. Uh, there are lots of situations, countless situations in which the distinction is simply non-workable. But nevertheless, the text you know, and the narrative gives you the impression that somehow you can distinguish different little problems. And then once those problems are identified, they become solvable, solvable little problems. So they create this order. Uh, they create this, this fiction, this impression that you are mastering the reality, you are understanding reality. And therefore, on that basis, you can perhaps you know, perform, you can start changing reality. Um, not sure it's going to work, but at least gives you the, the impression that you're doing something or that you're trying to address uh, the topic. So, you no, know, this is really, you know, political language uh, at its best, uh, identifying the problem, uh, making you feel like you can address reality, even though you can perhaps, you know, you, you're completely helpless, but at least at the level of language, uh, you, you, you feel like you, you, you're mastering the situation. <coughs> and of course, the issue is, you know, what's, what's the kind of order you have? There's another in the same book, Sigmund Bauman also writes that the other order is not another order, it's the chaos. So that's, that's an interesting aspect of the question. Uh, these narratives, they tend to present their order as the only possible order. So either you do that, or you do what they want you to do, or it will be chaos, it will be disorder. Uh, so they always, and that's, that's a very strong sort of deep politicizing trend. It's you no know, this famous, there's no alternative. We have uh, a solution. We have one way of looking at things. And if you do something else, it will not work. So our order is the only functional, workable uh, order. So this ordering function of, of international migration narratives, all the more necessary because you have a kind of threatening, complex, and perhaps you know, um, issue. Migration is this sort of threatening, complex issue that often seems beyond reach. Often the states feel powerless. There's a big literature on whether states can still control migration at all in a kind of globalizing world in which you know, this somehow borders are out of control. Um, and in this context, you need a text that tells you, well, yes, of course you can. You just have to understand the problem, uh, identify the solvable little problems, and then you will manage it. Uh, what you know, IOM and other UA agencies call migration management. Uh, this very reassuring way of presenting the issue as if you could manage migration just like you can manage any other topic. Uh, and perhaps the last slide here to open up on the discussion, perhaps to reintroduce the politicized uh, nature of migration. IMN keep trying to put aside this politicized uh, and uh, you know, aspect of migration. Um, and of course, the issue is, you know, what role, what role plays, what do, what role do, do myth play in this politicization? Uh, there's a, a you know, standard, a very well-known quote by, by Roland Barthes here from his book, Les Mythologies, the Mythologies, I guess was translated, in which he argues that, you know, myth are kind of conservative, so to say, because they take reality and he has this idea that reality is always 
moving. You know, it's shaped by history, it's shaped by actors, it can change again in different directions, but somehow the myth sort of reifies reality and moves it outside of history, outside of possible changes, and uh, it becomes a harmonious display of essences, like Hornobart uh, says, uh, the world becomes sort of, you know, fixed, uh, unchangeable, uh, and that's, he argues, is a very conservative uh, process. Uh, the myth is really sort of, you know, freezing the possibility for changes. And there's, you know, an emerging critical uh, approach to IMN that says precisely this, that says basically uh, IOM and UN uh, organizations, they have this understanding of migration that posits a very unequal world, it posits the fact that we have rich and poor country. It posits the fact that there will be people leaving poor countries to go to richer countries. And that's it. Uh, that's no, there's no way you can change this. Uh, this is the context. Uh, and it becomes a kind of natural aspect of the world, a naturalization of the social in, in a way inspired by, by Roland Barthes. Um, and a natural image of this reality, as he writes, uh, that's the way it is. You have an uh, unequal world um, with lots of uh, imbalances, uh, with lots of conflicts, with lots of poverty, uh, with lots of people you know, having to leave whatever their country, but that's it. Uh, so once you have identified this world and you have fixed it uh, as unchangeable, then the issue is how do you manage migration? Uh, how do you, you know, address the outcome of this reality in terms of people's uh, mobility? And this sort of say freezes the world and makes it completely impossible to think outside the box, so to say, and to, for example, address root causes. Uh, there's a big literature, uh, NGOs uh, often lament that uh, UN agencies, they kind of ignore root causes. Uh, root causes is typically the reason why people leave their place, their country in the first place, um, poverty, you know, global capitalism, war, uh, all kinds of you know, post-colonial uh, patterns of, of domination and, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, the, the question is, therefore, uh, how do you bring this inside IMN? Actually, you don't bring this in, inside IMN. IMN tend to assume that the world is as it is. That is to say that there are root causes and there's not much that can be done. Um, so you have to manage migration precisely because migration will always take place because this, the key factors, the root causes, are part of the, of the of sort of natural image of reality. And this actually completely obscures potential other ways of addressing migration, politically speaking. <coughs> For example, um, in, this, in this view, if you assume that root causes will always exist, they are part of the natural um, state of things, so to say, and a natural um, um, way of, um, well, natural um, aspect of the world. Uh, well, then, of course, you have to manage migration because somehow there will always be too many migrants who want to migrate and therefore uh, management is a kind of post control uh, terminology, but still it's very much about control. It's about steering people's mobility for the sake of development, for the sake of growth, for the state, sake of uh, state's interest, uh, and so on. And this completely obscures other possibility. Uh, for example, thinking about you know, free movement, for example, or thinking about uh, radically different policies that would you know, address root causes and uh, you know, prevent conflict or extreme poverty or climate change and so on. All these uh, this, this ways of thinking are actually excluded from IMN. As I said in the beginning, uh, IMN sort of you know, outlined what is sayable, thinkable, and what is not. And typically, indeed, uh, there are lots of ideas, uh, lots of words that are completely outside uh, IMN. Uh, for example, I did a search you know, with, the, with the, the search option of the computer, and IMN never used the word class, for example. That's a word that simply never uh, exists according to IMN. You have countries, you have uh, developed countries, less developed countries. You never have anything about class and whether you know migration fits into renewed patterns of class struggles, for example. This simply does not exist according to IMN. It would be, you know, simply un it's unthinkable it would be too sensitive, and therefore it's it's outside uh, the picture, so to say. Um, so there are lots of words that are simply outside the, the, the topic. And perhaps just to conclude, uh, we may want to, uh, to, re to 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 conclude that when you have a political language or you have, when you have IMN in front of you, you have to study what they say, what it is inside the text, 
but you also have to study what's outside. And perhaps what is outside matters even more than what's inside. What is at the margin somehow is forgotten, is neglected, becomes almost invisible to the extent that, you know, it does shape the way we think about migration today, the way we do research, um, and so on. So I think I'm going to stop here um, about this sort of, you know, bringing in again the political function of myth as a way of freezing reality and reinforcing uh, patterns of domination and uh, patterns of, you know, uh, of, of power, uh, power relations inside societies and not contributing to challenge uh, these patterns of, of power uh, and not you know, introducing new alternative uh, perspective. So thanks a lot for your attention. I'm just going to leave the PowerPoint to see you again.